Welcome to RAD 2.11. RAD 2.11 is one of those classes. This is Procedures 3. And this is one of those classes in which uh, sometimes students will come to me and they'll say, uh, how come we have to learn all this material? I already know how to make a chest x-ray. I know how to do abdomen and hand x-rays. Why do I have to know about all, this, uh, all these contrast procedures? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, you will have to know this material for the registry. There's no doubt. So this is part of your registry preparation. And the other thing is I feel it's important when you're at the hospital to not be the only person in the room that doesn't know what's going on. So in my view, when it comes to radiography, there's no such thing as TMI. The more you know, the more effective you're going to be as a radiographer. Now suppose for a moment that you and I are at a car dealership and I am the salesman and you've decided that you really like this orange car here and I don't blame you. I mean it looks really nice. I can see myself cruising up and down Wrightsville Beach in a ride like this and I tell you hey um, you know this car is gonna be fifty thousand dollars and I'm gonna have it ready to go for you this coming Friday and all you have to do is uh, pay me now and then you can come and pick up your car okay cool so Friday comes around and you show up to pick up your car and from around the side of the building here I come with this okay now question uh, do you feel like you've gotten your fifty thousand dollars worth or do you feel like you've been gypped uh, the reason I use this little illustration is because a uh, wise man once said that education is the one business exchange in which the customer wants to get gypped. In other words, if I charge you $1,000 to come to my class and then I wind up letting you go early every day or you know we just kind of goof off and then you get to the end of the class and you've got an A but you haven't really learned anything, do you feel like you've gotten your money's worth? Probably not. So in this class, every day as we're going through, I'm going to try to make sure that you get your money's worth and that you learn what you need. Something else I tell students. Uh, whenever you're in the radiography program, you're actually kind of on a journey. Um, your journey is towards a location that I call Mount RT. You're ultimately wanting to be a registered technologist in radiography and you want to know everything that you need to in order to function as a technologist. Now it just so happens um, I've been teaching now since 2004, however many years that is. Well I've been up and down Mount Radiography many many times and I know where the good paths are and I also know where the crevasses are where people can fall in and wind up getting uh, you know kind of falling by the wayside if you follow me and you know just kind of go along with the program and do what I'm telling you then at some point in time you're gonna triumphantly be standing on top of Mount Radiography and you're going to sit for your registry and you're going to be highly successful. This is where I want us all to wind up. Now for those that do not want to pay attention, you can wind up in an unfortunate situation such as this. Um, here's an individual that for whatever reason didn't make it up Mount Everest and uh, has now become somewhat of a landmark because there's no way to remove the body. Um, he's going to be there forever. Anyway, don't wind up like the green boots guy. I want you to wind up on top of the summit with me. Oh, never mind. This is just something for the class from last year. So we're going to skip over all that. Arthrography. Now, this whole um, presentation is on arthrograms. 
and I draw most of my information from the Bontrager book of radiography and there's other things that I've picked up uh, just from the hospital on the way and um, yeah so I, I have a, a rather large uh, base that I draw from a lot of which is just my own practical experience because I've done a lot of arthrograms. Okay now uh, if you take a look, these images are kind of old. Uh, as you can see, the copyright on these things is Mosby 2001. Um, but arthrography hasn't really changed all that much uh, as far as the flat films go. Um, a lot of times arthrograms are done of the knee uh, for people that have um, like compressed menisci. We can take a look and see what those things are looking like. We also do a lot of shoulder arthrograms because people will... Um, quote unquote, throw out their shoulder. They'll have a torn rotator cuff possibly. And if the doctor's got any doubt about the rotator cuff being torn, he can do an arthrogram and that'll show him definitively if there is a rupture of the synovial capsule. Um, they also do wrist arthrography. It's possible to do TMJs, although nowadays a lot of this stuff is done um, using MRI. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of arthrography is done using MRI. What we do is just make sure that the gadolinium is located in the joint space correctly prior to the patient going over for their MRI. So it's kind of a, a combination study. Now keep in mind, arthrography is an invasive procedure. We have to have informed consent from the client. Um, you can't just grab people and start sticking needles in them. Um, normally the RT will go over the consent form, but ultimately the doctor is the one responsible for answering the patient's questions and obtaining the patient's consent. Um, whenever we're in this, um, whenever we're in this function, we're actually performing as what's called the arm of the doctor. So, um, yeah, we're we're like the doctor's go-between. Uh, we go ahead and tell the patient what's going to be happening. But then when the doctor comes in, he can answer their particular questions. And here's a question. What if we don't have consent? Well, if we don't have consent, we can't do this procedure. Um, you, like I said, you can't just stick needles in people without them writing down um, or putting down in writing that they've the, the procedure's been explained, the risks and the benefits have been made very clear, and they still want to go through with the procedure. Here's a little review of arthrology. Uh, there are several different classes of joints in the body. There are synarthrotic syn joints, synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses, and we're going to see some examples of all of these. Um, class, classification of joints according to their structure. Some joints are considered fibrous. Um, that's the synarthrotic joints. The cartilaginous joints are considered amphiarthrotic. They are movable, slightly movable. And synovial joints are the ones that are freely movable. Like uh, if you flex your fingers, or you move your wrist, or you flex and extend your elbow, then what you're doing there is moving synovial joints. They're characterized by synovial fluid contained inside of a capsule. These joints are all freely movable. Um, now, there are some joint categories that we're going to talk about. Uh, ball and socket joint, of course, everybody knows that their shoulder is a ball and socket joint. The hip is another one, uh, where the, the head of the femur plugs into the acetabulum, forms a ball and socket joint. There are many, many hinge joints in the body. Uh, your elbow, your knee, those are both examples. And uh, ellipsoidal or condylar joints. We also have pivot joints, saddle joints and gliding joints. And on the next slide I've got some examples of all of these. Uh, we talked already a little bit about the ball and socket and the hinge joints. Now the ellipsoidal joints, um, that's what your wrist is. The wrist is a funny looking joint. If you look at it under um, radiography, under an x-ray, there's actually eight separate bones in there and on an x-ray they just look like a bag of bones but in reality there's a lot of tendons and ligaments in there that hold all those bones together and enable your wrist to move in a lot of different directions. Just take your wrist right now and, um, and just kind of move it around and see which ways you can move it. Um, it's very, very 
um, flexible. Uh, it can move in a lot of different directions. Now, pivot joints. Uh, there's a few of these in the body. Um, probably the most uh, widely thought of is the atlantoaxial joint at the base of the skull. Okay, it's where um, C1 and C2, uh, you know how the dens um, enable C1 and C2 to kind of rotate, not 180 degrees or anything, but, but they can rotate pretty good. Uh, another example is the where the radius meets the radial notch in the elbow. That's also considered a pivot joint. It enables you to pronate and supinate your hand. Saddle joints, there's only one in the body. That would be the first metacarpal and the trapezium. Those form what's called a saddle joint, and it's just named because of the shape of it. If you look at a skeleton, then you'll see what I'm talking about. And then there's many gliding joints in the body. Some examples are the AC joints in the shoulder, the sternoclavicular joints, and then all of the costovertebral joints. Those joints are considered gliding joints. They can move, no problem, but they're kind of limited as to how they move. Okay, for purposes of arthrography, we're mostly interested in the synovial joints. Synovial joints uh, take their name from the clear fluid, the synovial fluid, that forms the lubricant um, for that joint. People that have arthritis or people that are severely dehydrated, a lot of times they have joint pain and difficulty moving because their synovial fluid is depleted. Um, the synovial membrane is basically, and I've got a picture of, of it somewhere in here, I think. Um, synovial membrane is around each joint, and it encloses that joint, and it keeps the synovial fluid from um, escaping. Right. Uh, there are some articular structures around some of these joints. Um, there are fat pads. The most classic example, I suppose, are the fat pads that are around the elbow. And if those fat pads are um, displaced, and sometimes they show up on an x-ray, if those fat pads are displaced, then that can indicate either a hidden uh, fracture or a small dislocation. You know, if it's a big dislocation, it's going to be obvious. You're not going to need the fat pads to tell you that. The menisci are located in your knees. There's two in each knee, and those things are basically thick cartilaginous pads that allow your knees to function as a shock absorber whenever you're walking or running. And then highline cartilage. Highline cartilage is, uh, and if you've ever eaten fried chicken, you know all about highline cartilage. It's at the end of each bone. And... Um, we can't really see it on an x-ray. It doesn't show up all that well. As a matter of fact, it's mostly radiolucent. But the hyaline cartilage covers the end of each bone, each of your long bones, and it forms like a slick surface so that the bones can um, articulate without grinding. If you lose your hyaline cartilage, then you're going to have a form of arthritis that's going to be extremely painful. If you have bone grinding on bone, that doesn't feel too good. And then ligaments are found inside the joints. Um, there's several ligaments in the knees, um, like the, the ACL and the PCL, the anterior and posterior crucius ligaments. What ligaments do is they hold the bones together so that they don't, um, and also they, in addition to holding the bones together, the long bones I'm talking about, the ligaments prevent the bones from being able to move in an undesirable direction. So if you think of your knee, for example, your knee hinges back, um, no problem. You can flex your knee, but you can only extend your knee to a certain point. You know, for example, you wouldn't be able to take your toe and kick yourself in the chin because your knee does not bend. Um, you know, your knee bends posteriorly. It does not bend anteriorly. If it does, then that means you've got serious ligamentous damage. Now, knee arthrography. Most of the time when we're doing an arthrogram of the knee, what we're looking for is uh, tears in the joint capsule or damage to the menisci. When the meniscus gets damaged, um, there can be like a torn chunk of cartilage hanging off of it. Because remember, these things are under a lot of pressure, especially for those of us that are, you know, say somewhat above our ideal body mass index. Um, we put a lot of extra strain on our knees, and that can cause these menisci to either get crushed flat, which, you know, that's going to give you a problem. That's, um, that's going to 
reduce the size of that compartment and it's going to cause pain. I can tell you that from experience. Um, we can also have ligament injuries. Sometimes people that play a lot of sports, uh, soccer, softball, uh, football, basketball, they get injured like um, practicing or during a game and sometimes their ligaments get either hyperextended or even torn. And so if there's a ligament injury, we might be able to spot it on a flat arthrogram. Now, contraindications to arthrography. We're going to have to inject a contrast agent into this joint capsule. If the patient is seriously allergic to contrast, then that might be a contraindication to this study. Um, local anesthetics, that may or may not be a contraindication. No lie, I've seen physicians, radiologists, inject contrast into pe people's joints without using any anesthetic. They just basically tell the patient to hang on to something and they just stick the needle right in there. And like we said before, we need informed consent. Okay, here's some more indications you might see. Um, arthritis, that can be a, an, on, um, an indication. And indications are reasons why we do things. Uh, there can be cysts around the joints. Um, cysts are just little pockets of liquid that form. Uh, sometimes they're in reaction to uh, strain. Sometimes they're in reaction to an infection. And then sometimes um, little cysts form and we don't really know why they did. Uh, loose bodies. Typically a loose body in a joint capsule is going to be either a little chunk of cartilage or um, I was going to say a chunk of bone, but that would be really, really scarce. Um, that would only be like if the patient had been in a car crash or something like that. Most of the time it's just like a torn piece of cartilage that's floating around and sometimes it gets jammed up in the joint and causes the patient not to be able to flex or extend that joint. Um, and it can be painful too. Now for knee arthrography, torn meniscus is by far the most uh, popular diagnosis. That's what we're looking for when we do these. Again, contraindications, reasons why we would not do this study. Contrast sensitivity or if the joint space had an active infection or inflammation going on. Now in this case, does it mean we're never going to do the study? No. Probably what the doctor is going to do is give the patient an antibiotic regimen and send them home and reschedule them for next week. Um, you know, then once their infection is cured, then we can go ahead and do the study. Contrast agents. It is entirely possible to use CO2 or some other kind of gas to do pneumoarthrography. Um, this was kind of the state of the art 50 years ago, but since it's uh, fallen into disuse, it just doesn't give as much information. I just mention it here because um, we're going to see in just a minute, sometimes there are double contrast arthrography studies in which case you need to apply positive contrast. And here's some contrast agents you might see used. Isoview, Omnipake, OptiRay. Now those are probably the most popular and the reason why is because they are non-ionic contrast agents. Things like Renographin, Conray, Hypake, I've seen those used for arthrography studies, um, but for the last couple years, um, they've mostly been using the Omnipeg and the OptiRay, stuff like that, um, because it is so much less likely for the patient to have an adverse reaction. Now, a lot of times what we're doing is we're setting this patient up for an MRI. So we'll take, um, take something like Sensorcane or Marcane, and then mix that with some Omnipeg. Okay, so now we've got some anesthetic and we've got some x-ray dye. And then the doctor will mix in a little bit of gadolinium. You know, just a few cc's is all you need. And that way we've got um, kind of a combination cocktail going on. We will, you know, deaden the pain using the, the Marcane or the sensor cane. We'll be able to see it all under x-ray because we've got the Omnipake on board. And then once the patient gets over to MRI, then the gadolinium will be manifest once they're inside the magnetic field. Because as you guys probably know, um, X-ray contrast agents don't show up on an MRI, and MRI contrast agents don't show up on an X-ray. So we have to have both if we're going to, you know, do if we're going to do fluoroscopy followed by MRI, then we need that um, combination. 
Okay, reactions. It is possible, it's very, very unlikely, but it is possible for the patient to have a severe allergic reaction. If they have a bona fide anaphylactic reaction, then you're going to need to call for help sooner than later. Because what will happen, if the patient is really allergic to your contrast agent, then it can cause their blood pressure to bottom out, and at the same time it can also cause their throat and their bronchioles to start constricting. That patient's going to need a shot of epinephrine, MOS, pronto. So hopefully you've got some uh, nurses or doctors close by that can help with this. Something else that can happen is, and this isn't life-threatening by any means, but it can be very painful for the patient, is something called synovitis, which is inflammation of the joint capsule. Um, you know, like I said, it's probably not uh, going to cause the patient any serious health concerns, but as you know, inflammation of anything is uncomfortable. So if we inflame their joint space, you know, that's not really doing them a favor. Vasovagal reaction. This is the most popular. Whenever you start coming towards a patient holding a needle, and it doesn't matter if you're getting ready to do an arthrogram or if you're just getting ready to draw some blood. I've seen patients at the Red Cross pass out just from looking at the needle as it's coming towards their skin. Um, that's called a vasovagal reaction. This is like a panic reaction, and it can cause nausea, uh, heavy perspiration, um, pale skin, dizziness, uh, sinking sensation, or a feeling like you're falling, and people can actually have syncopal episodes. They can pass out. So a lot of times you're going to see the vasovagal reaction. Um, what you can do about that is inform the patient up front. You know, tell them what we're going to be doing and let them know. You know, the doctor's going to come in, he's going to have to put a needle in, it's not going to hurt so much. If the patient knows what to expect, then that can go a long way towards helping avoid some of these, um, some of these adverse reactions. Okay, uh, procedure for the knee arthrogram. The first thing, and you may or may not do scalp radiographs. Um, some doctors like to have the scalps, uh, you know, just so that they can... I don't know, see if there's anything there that would prevent them from doing the arthrogram. The other thing, and really the main reason for doing the scalp radiographs, is so that we can adjust our technique if needed. When we used to do this using film, you know, just plain film, it was kind of a big deal. Nowadays, you know, we're using uh, digital CR and DR. So, you know, you still want to use a good technique, but... Okay. Two to four milliliters of anesthetic. And then the needle is inserted between the patella and the medial femoral condyle. Okay, so if anybody ever asks you, where's the needle placement for a knee arthrogram, you just tell them between the patella and the femoral condyle, or just say retropatellar space. Synovial fluid withdrawn possibly. I have seen doctors withdraw a little of the synovial fluid to send it to the lab. I've also seen doctors inject a little bit of saline um, with patients that were suffering from dehydration because they tried to drop some synovial fluid and there was nothing there. And we know that we're in the joint space because we got a, a fluoroscopy machine going. And so we know the needle's in the right place, but there's no fluid being drawn up. So the doctors will sometimes inject some sterile saline and uh, then wait a few seconds and then draw up a syringe and hope to, you know, capture not only the saline they just injected, but any, um, like, cellular debris or whatever happens to be in the joint space. Uh, contrast is going to be injected. Um, usually this is just going to be positive contrast. Although, like I said earlier, uh, it is possible to do double contrast studies. And sometimes the doctor will ask the patient to flex their knee. Sometimes they'll even ask them to stand up and walk on it a little bit. Um, and then they'll uh, take some overheads and spot films. Now, equipment that you're going to need. You're going to have to have a flora room or a C-arm. Um, either one will work just fine. You need an arthrogram tray, and that tray is going to have a selection of fine needles, syringes, sponges, um, possibly forceps, and one or two um, little cups for medicine. Uh, some trays just have like a, uh, what do you call it, like a depression, where you can pour 
alcohol or betadine or anything that you need. And here's a picture. Again, you know, this is an old picture, but whenever I worked at the hospital a couple years ago, this basically is what our myelogram tray looked like. You know, you've got a selection of needles, a selection of hypodermics. There's a little ampule here of lidocaine. Um, this tubing right here. Um, okay, just kind of a funny story. Once upon a time, uh, the person that was supposed to be ordering arthrogram trays for us did not realize that we were about to run out. And so by the time they ordered any trays, it was going to be like a couple of weeks before we were going to be able to get them. So for that time, whenever somebody came in for an arthrogram, what we had to do was go to the PAR room and also back to interventional and try to round up all this material. Um, we'd have to get a fenestrated drape. And this tubing here was a pain to find. You know, it's like every piece of IV tubing we got, it seems like is three or four feet long. To find this short tubing that's only like one foot long, that was rare. Uh, it turned out the only place in the hospital that had it was the interventional suite. And so we would have to go back there and beg for some tubing. Um, this little razor here, more often on um, myelograms have I seen patients with like a hairy back that we had to shave them before the doctor could do the injection. Most of the time, if you're looking at somebody's knee or shoulder, they're typically not that hairy. But if somebody does come in that's really her suit, then you can just take a razor and, um, you know, just scrape the hair off in uh, like a four inch area. And then the doctor can use that area for his injection. Okay, and this is just like a list of typical supplies that you would need for an arthrogram. We kind of uh, went over this already. It is a sterile procedure. Um, we don't want to introduce any kind of bacteria into the patient's joint space, or even worse yet, a fungus. You know, that would be a bad outcome for that patient. Oh. I uh, should mention, um, wait until the patient has settled down. Make sure that they've been to the bathroom, they've blown their nose, they've washed their hands. Um, you know, whatever they need to do that's going to involve them getting up off the table, make sure that's all taken care of before you open the sterile tray. And if, you, if you've got the sterile tray open and the patient needs to get up off the table, then before they do, roll that table, um, or roll, put that tray out of the way somewhere so that the patient can't touch it. Because if the patient touches the tray, you have to throw it away and start over, and that tray costs money. All right, I'm not going to really belabor this too terribly much. Um, you know, you just want to make sure that your contrast is in place and that you can um, basically see all the anatomical structures that you need to. If your contrast is leaking out of the joint space, well, there's nothing you can do. That just means the synovial joint is torn, or I'm sorry, the synovial capsule is torn. And the main thing is like if, uh, if we're going to take this patient over to MRI, let's get them over there sooner than later, because the more that fluid leaks out of the joint space, the more difficulty they're going to have, um, you know, getting their images. Okay, for shoulder arthrography, um, basically this is your setup. You've got your patient lying on the table, and their head is either going to be at the head of the table, or they could be turned around with their head towards the foot of the table. You want the joint of interest to be closest to the doctor, so that he doesn't have to try to reach across the patient or anything like that. And, you know, here's that little short tubing I was telling you guys about. Um, this way we can um, fluoroscopy and the doctor can inject contrast simultaneously. And remember, this is a sterile procedure. Um, you're, while you're driving the fluoro tower, just make sure you don't bump into any of this tubing or anything. You don't want to violate the sterile field. And here's what the needle placement looks like. This is when the doctor is, um, and you see right here where there's a, a marker. If you can, put your marker on the fluoro tower, like up underneath the fluoro tower, so that the marker always goes with, um, you know, with the movement of the tower. So the doctor has got the needle into the joint space, and it looks like coming off right here is the uh, IV line. And they've injected a little bit of contrast, but not a whole lot at this point. But this is kind of how the thing looks. 
And you guys remember your anatomy, I hope. Um, there's going to be a quiz later. You know, what is A, B, C, D, E, F, G? I'm kidding. I'm just showing you guys how the uh, arm is positioned for external rotation of the shoulder. Okay, uh, and here it is again. Um, at this point, you can pause the video if you want to and just examine all of these different points of anatomical interest. Um, and if you're in the radiography program, you probably could do this blindfolded. Okay, now, positioning sequence. Um, scout, if there is one. Sometimes the doctor will say, well, let's take a couple pictures. Let's do internal and external rotation um, before you start the arthrography. And then once the image is taken, uh, I'm sorry, once the uh, contrast is delivered and the doctor's already done all their overheads, sometimes they might want you to do um, like a single AP view or an axillary view, something like that, basically so that if we send this patient over to MRI and the MRI techs are like, hey, um, you know, that contrast is not where it's supposed to be, well, then we have images we can look at and we can say, well, when the patient left here, the contrast was in place. Um, and so if it's moved like between here and there, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, it's not our fault. I should mention here, if you work in a hospital, um, there's a lot of finger pointing between departments. It's unpleasant, but it just kind of goes with the turf. All right, sometimes with shoulder arthrography, the doctor will ask the patient to stand up and just kind of move their arm around in uh, small circles, um, gently exercise the shoulder, and then take some more pictures. Um, rotator cuff. Okay, your rotator cuff is actually mostly made up of soft tissue. Here's a list of the four muscles that make up the bulk of the rotator cuff. And unlike the hip, this socket is mostly soft tissue. Um, and we saw that in our x-ray just a few minutes ago. Um, you know, when you're looking at a, a shoulder x-ray, the only bones there are the scapula. You know, you see the, the GH joint of the scapula. And then you see the head of the humerus. And that's pretty much it. Oh, and the clavicle. Uh, the clavicle is kind of hanging out there too. But mostly it's muscle. Okay, and here's an example of uh, arthrography. Um, the needle is out, so this, this is um, post-injection, and we've just taken a look to see if the contrast is in place, and it looks like that the contrast is leaking out of the synovial joint, so I suppose this patient must have a, a torn rotator cuff. All right, and here's another picture that I grabbed from medical arbitrary, I'm sorry, medicalartlibrary.com. And the reason why I wanted to show you guys this is because sometimes my students will say, well, where the heck is the articular capsule? Okay, well, right here it goes. It's, um, it's like a tough layer of, um, or tough membrane that surrounds this whole joint. And this is a cutaway. Uh, this is actually a three-dimensional structure. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, you can see there's like a space in here that's got fluid in it so that when your shoulder moves, it's not impinging directly on the uh, scapula. You know, the scapula is covered with cartilage at this point, too. This is that high-line articular car cartilage that I was telling you guys about. Um, I don't know if you all know this or not, but most of your joints have got bursa associated with them. What a bursa is, is just like a little bag of fluid, and it's the body's way of, um, you know, like putting cushioning in place around joints that move a lot. I think in the knee you have like three or four different um, sacs that are bursa. Uh, they're kind of like a hydraulic pillow. And here's a artist's conception. And see this? Okay, whenever we're taking x-rays, you know how it looks like that there's just like a gap right here between the scapula and the um, clavicle, you know, right here at this AC joint. In reality, there's like some really, really strong bands of tissue holding those bones together, unless, of course, it breaks, uh, which is a lot of times that's why we're looking at images of the AC um, so anyway, remember, here's the coracoid process that sticks out in front of the scapula, 
And here's another big band of tissue. Uh, these ligaments hold this part of the scapula to this part of the scapula and hold it to the um, clavicle. And then we've got these big tendons here connected to these muscles. Another big band of tendons back here. And oops, that tendon has torn. Okay, so when these tendons tear, that can actually cause a rupture in the um, synovial capsule and cause leakage of the synovial fluid into the surrounding tissues. So this is an example of a rotator cuff tear. You see damage here and here. Um, and this rotator cuff tears are pretty popular amongst people that play like recreational baseball and softball because, you know, if you imagine yourself throwing a ball, you know, that motion just repeating over and over again can cause damage. Uh, the other thing is, same thing, you know, people that play recreational softball, sometimes they'll be up there and they'll just like be swinging a bat as hard as they can. And if they're not careful and they don't have their body mechanics right, they can wind up damaging their shoulder, um, you know, just by swinging a bat. Okay, wrist arthrography, I'm going to go over this pretty fast. Um, when you're setting up for wrist arthrography, you know how usually when we have a patient for a wrist x-ray, we sit them at the end of the table in a chair. Well, for wrist arthrography, um, the only way that'll work is if you're using a C-arm. If you're using a table-based fluoro tower, then the patient's going to have to be on the table prone and with their hand extended, and um, then you're going to drive the fluoro tower over top of their wrist. So you'll have to move the patient down the table until, um, you know, until you can get a good image of their wrist using your fluoro tower. Put a rolled up towel under their hands so that the wrist is flexed just a little. And sometimes because the, um, just because of the nature of the wrist joint, it's very complex. Like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of tendons, a lot of ligaments in there. Sometimes it's almost like a, like multiple compartments. So the doctor might inject contrast into the wrist and it doesn't necessarily permeate the entire wrist. The doctor may have to inject two or even three times before he's got his contrast, um, you know, all in the joint so that he can see what's going on in there. And you see, whenever you're looking at a wrist x-ray, it just looks like, okay, well, here's some bones hanging out here. Um, are those things just a bag of marbles? You know, they loose in there? Well, it turns out not so much. Uh, I've got a couple slides here that'll show you um, the way these joint spaces work. Now, this is just like a cartoon image of somebody's wrist, but what they've done is they've, in addition to having the bones in here, oh yeah, know your wrist bones, because you'll definitely be tested on those. But you can see there's like bands of ligament all through here that are holding these bones together, you know? And when you think about it, it makes sense. You can't just have a bag of marbles. You gotta have those things bound together some way so that they stay in the same order. Um, you know, otherwise you might have your scaphoid bone way over by your ulna, you know, that obviously wouldn't work. And this is kind of, okay, if we're looking at this patient's, um, we're looking at this patient's wrist, and this is from a lateral aspect, and the doctor would just, you know, drive a needle down into the joint space carefully, and then start injecting contrast and see, you know, where it goes. And here's an example. Here's a wrist arthrogram. And as you can see, what the doctor has done, I don't see the needle here, um, but the doctor has injected contrast, and contrast is permeating, but it's not, you know, like if the, if the trouble was up in here somewhere, there's no contrast up there. Um, so the doctor would need at least one more injection. And here it is from a lateral aspect. And here's another one. Again, you know, just so you can see, here's the contrast coming in. And you can see it's, um, you know, kind of permeating some of the wrist, but not the whole thing. Okay, a little bit more. Um, just make sure your PA and lateral radiographs are taken with proper technique. Um, elbow, flex 90 degrees, uh, if possible. But like I said, a lot of times these patients are going to be lying prone on the table, so the elbow won't be flexed. It'll just be extended out, and then the doctor might ask the patient to just rotate their arm into a lateral, um, you know, because the, the fluoro tower is what it is. Um, we've got x-rays coming up from below. We can't do like a shoot across or anything like that. Um, anyway, 
Uh, that's about it for arthrography. I hope you guys have enjoyed this and maybe learned a little bit. Um, go back to your book, study arthrography, and with any luck whatsoever, you'll be ready to take your registry. All right, and good luck with that. Take care uh, and have a great day.